All right, everybody, good to see you all here. Um, everybody ready for the lecture today? How's everybody uh, getting on? Uh, so uh, just a quick reminder, um, has everybody filled in the um, mid-module uh, feedback uh, form? Great. So if you haven't already, please do just fill that. It only takes a couple of minutes, right? It's not a long thing. And it's really useful to have the, uh, the feedback from, uh, from everybody. It really is helpful. So thank you very much, everybody, who's already uh, completed that. Uh, so today, we're continuing what we were, the kind of that thread we started last week, thinking about energy. But what we're going to be focusing on this week is thermal energy. And this is such an important form of energy, really so crucial, it turns up so many different places, you know, whether you're studying sort of engineering or biology, understanding thermal energy, the energy associated with heat, it's absolutely essential for any of these things. So let's take a look at some of the things that we're going to be uh, focusing on uh, for this week. You'll notice at the top there, I've just got one bullet point about employability week. Has anybody seen anything about employability week on the website you've been emailed anything about that oh <laughs> things okay so i've just got a few things to say about that okay um but the main uh, topic for today we're going to be thinking about power temperature and heat and the kind of energy that we need to uh, to consider when we're thinking about these things and before we get to those just a quick recap a couple of things about uh, kinetic energy and a quick recap about conservation of energy. So how we have energy moving from one form to another. So that's the basic plan for today. Uh, now the picture I've got in the background, has anybody seen, uh, seen this picture before, something like that? So this is a picture um, in uh, Texas, it's called a Starbase. Uh, so SpaceX, they are assembling the most powerful rocket ever made and it's the world's first fully reusable rocket. Um, so that's one reason why it's so important, just because it's so powerful and fully reusable. But the thing I'd like to draw everyone's attention to specifically for this lecture today, so if you look at the, the booster there, it's all just shiny silver. It's just metal. But if you look at the actual ship on top, you can see it's got covered half, halfway covered in these black thermal protection tiles. And the reason is because the top half of the ship, it goes up into orbit and it's designed to re-enter. And when it re-enters, it has a huge amount of kinetic energy and it also has gravitational potential energy. And by the time the ship gets back down to the ground, it isn't going to have any kinetic energy and that gravitational potential energy is going to go away. And we know from the law of conservation of energy that this energy all has to go somewhere and where it goes is heat and that's why the ship needs to have these thermal protection tiles to stop the whole thing from melting and it's this idea of conservation of energy energy going from one form to another that we're really going to be focusing on over uh, this week now i did say at the start uh, we can have a few things about employability week so i just like to get things going with one very quick question thinking a bit about employability I'm just curious to find out from you guys, have you had any thoughts about what you might do after university? Now, you might say, well, hang on a minute, you know, we're only halfway through uh, the first semester. Maybe we don't need to kind of get ahead of ourselves too much. But it's always very useful to kind of start thinking, start putting together some ideas about what you might be doing after university. And what I'd like to get a sense from this question is just kind of where are you? on this scale, maybe you do know exactly what you'd like to do after university. Maybe you really have no idea at all, or maybe you're somewhere in the middle. Maybe there's kind of things you're thinking about, but you don't know um, exactly what it is. Now, I just really want to emphasize with this that there's absolutely no wrong answers here. Okay, wherever you are um, on this scale or anywhere in between, that's absolutely fine. I'm just kind of curious to see where everybody is. So I'll give you guys just a moment to put this question in. And then I'll see, uh, see what everybody thinks for this one. So I'll just emphasize, this is in no way legally binding, okay? You're very welcome to change your mind at a later date. All right, let's uh, have a look at what everybody got. 
for thinking about after university. So, it uh, looks like we've got an even split of people in between there. So, some people have some ideas but not sure, some plans. Now, some people know exactly and some people not sure at all. So, where's the people who know exactly what they want to do after university? Uh, yeah, what, what's, what's your thoughts? What, what would you... Uh... Uh, well, because of where I live, there's loads of renewable energy offshore, so I don't really know what Oh, fantastic. Working well, renewable energy. I think absolutely great kind of plan for something to, to, to work on after university. I mean, it's such an important thing, and I think it's something which, uh, you know, there's, there's so much demand. It's so expanding, but, you know, there's just so much demand for energy. Great, great thought there. Does anybody else have a kind of solid idea for exactly what they'd want to do after university. Oh, uh, yeah. Work for the Environment Agency. Oh, great. Work for the Environment Agency. Oh, brilliant. Uh, do you know what, what you'd be wanting, wanting to do there? Uh, like, like risks. Oh, wow. Flood risks. OK. Oh, fantastic. Oh, that's a really great, really great idea. Both a couple of great things. Does anyone else have a kind of solid idea of what they'd want to be doing after university? Uh, what about some of these people? Maybe you've got some ideas, but not sure. Where are the people who've got some ideas, but not sure? Oh, yeah. Um, I like the idea of OK, great. Research chemistry. OK. And I think that's, that's an absolutely kind of great stage to be at, that maybe there's kind of, you know, a field you're thinking about, but, you know, you don't know exactly what the kind of specific job would be. So, very interesting. Does anyone else have some ideas, but you're not sure? Yeah. Great, great couple of options. Um, so I think I, um, so think about maybe working in a lab or um, physics teaching. So I have had a bit of a chat with some of you guys. Um, and I know some people have mentioned they're thinking about going into teaching. Now, UEA has a very strong track record of getting people into really good PGC courses, lots of really good opportunities. And I know specifically for Employment Week, uh, there's lots of very good events specifically for teaching. So if you are kind of thinking about teaching, maybe even just something you're thinking about, have a look at where those events are on the employment week and um, have a think about that, okay? Um, so what about maybe you've got some plans, but really kind of nothing too exact, maybe just some things you're thinking about. Where, where are some of those people? Oh, yes. Yeah. What's your... Uh... Some, to some to do with cars. Okay, fine. And I think that, that also, that's great. But, you know, you're not saying, okay, I want to be exactly this kind of designer for a particular company, but something about cars, sure. Mechanical side of cars. Okay, great. And uh, also? Okay, fine. Absolutely great. Marine biology, geophysics. Great, great options. Anyone else have some things they're thinking about but not sure about? Okay, so where are the people and you're just you're really not sure at all what to be doing? Okay, okay, a few people. So I think if you're really not sure what to do, that is also absolutely fine. I really want to stress there are really no wrong answers with this. Um, and I think also, you know, university, it's a great time to figure this out. And I think with all of you, with all the different degrees you're doing, the great thing about this, you know, with physics, with engineering, mathematics, you know, even with uh, chemistry is that you're not pinned down to a particular career. So if maybe your second, your third year, you think, oh, wow, that's something really fascinating that I hadn't thought about before. You know, you've got those options. You can kind of develop those interests. The last thing I'll say about um, the kind of careers and things for now is when you're thinking about things that you might want to do after university, it can be tempting to think, okay, well, I'm just going to sit and just think really hard about, you know, what I like doing and, you know, the kind of place I might want to be after graduating. And just, I'll just think really hard about that. But there's actually some parallels in thinking what you want to do after university to how we go about learning physics. Because remember, whenever we're learning anything new in physics, you don't learn that just by sitting there and thinking powerfully hard and trying to hope all the pieces come together. You learn physics the same way you learn anything. You learn it by doing things, by getting stuck in with problems, working through questions, working through things uh, from the textbook, working through things in the workshops. That's how you go about learning physics. And if you're not sure what you want to do after university, the only way to really figure out is to try doing things. Maybe you've got some ideas, and then you go and try them. Maybe you go along to some events, and you think, well, hey, actually, maybe not for me so much. 
Or maybe there's something that you've never thought of before, but there's some event or something you give a try. And you think, oh, well, actually, there's some things about this that I really like. So the only way that you can really know is by doing things, by giving it a try. So it's just like um, learning anything, really. So really interesting to see the kind of range of responses. I do like hearing about everything that uh, people are thinking about, the plans that people have. OK, so thank you all very much for putting that in. That's always useful to see. Now, before we move on to the new stuff for today, I just have a couple of quick recap questions I'm uh, thinking about kinetic energy and thinking about conservation of energy. So let's just try these questions. I think my clicker, it's, it's on hiatus at the moment. Oh, oh but there we go. I knew I was talking about it. Okay. So, um, so with this question, we're thinking a bit about kinetic energy and how it applies to road safety. So especially if you're thinking about maybe going into the automobile industry, important question to think about here. So what we have is how much more kinetic energy does a car have when it's driving along at 20 miles an hour versus 30 miles an hour? So I'll get this question going. Let's see what everybody thinks for this question. So remember, the mass isn't going to change. It's the same mass of the car. The only difference is the velocity. So really, we're looking at the ratio of 30 squared to 20 squared. That's going to give us the ratio of kinetic energy at these different speeds. OK, let's take a look at the responses for this one. Let's see what everybody gets for this one. How much more energy do we have? Ah, OK, so nobody's going for A. Not so many people for C. Let me think about B and D. Now, I can see why you might be going for B, because if you look at the speeds, 30 miles an hour, that's 1.5 times 20 miles an hour. So that is the ratio of our speeds. But remember, the energy, it depends on mv squared. Okay, so we've got to square the velocity and look at that ratio. So when you do that, we get that the ratio is 2.3 times. So option D here is the correct result there. So very well done, everybody who gave that question a go. What does everybody think about this one? Is that surprising to anybody? What about what you'd expect? You didn't, didn't really get it? In terms of working out the value or... OK, OK. So maybe, maybe we can go over that in the drop-in session after the, uh, after the lecture. Um, the thing I want to emphasize about this question is you might say, well, 30 miles an hour, you know, it's only 50% faster than 20 miles an hour. But because the energy depends on v squared, when we do 30 squared divided by 20 squared, our energy is more than twice as much. So your car, if you're driving at 30 miles an hour, you have more than twice as much kinetic energy than at 20. And this is really important for road safety, because if you do have a crash, what's going to determine how much damage is caused is how much energy there is in the car. So if you're driving along at 30, you've got more than twice as much energy. So it is an important thing for road safety. And it's one of the reasons, the physics behind a lot of these road safety campaigns. Now with vehicles in particular, there are a couple of other factors, so things like stopping distance and that kind of thing. But fundamentally, from a physics point of view, it's this energy that makes speeding so dangerous, okay, and so important to think about from a safety point of view. So very well done, everybody who gave, who gave that question a go. Now at the end of the last lecture, we had that energy conservation question where we had, you know, a roller coaster and it's up on the top of the hill and it has some gravitational potential energy and it rolls down the hill and then it gains some kinetic energy. Now, what I'd like to think about in the next question is kind of the reverse situation. So suppose we fire something upwards with some velocity, some kinetic energy. How high is it going to go based on that kinetic energy. So let's take a look at the question here. We're thinking about a rocket, and the rocket, it's got some velocity v. And what we want to think about is how high is the rocket going to go? So I'll get this question started. Let's see what everybody thinks for this one. So with this question, you really don't have to guess about anything. We have everything we need there to figure out what's going on. So we know that our potential energy, it's going to be equal to our kinetic energy. So we really just have to set these two equal 
and solve for the height with a bit of algebra. All right, let's see what everybody gets for this one. What do we get when we work through the algebra? What do we get for the uh, height of our rocket here? Okay, so some people going for A, B, and C. Most people going for D. So what we get, so we have, let's write this out here. So we've got our potential energy is going to be equal to our kinetic energy. So we have M. G H, so our um, potential energy is equal to one half m v squared. Okay, that's what we get when we set it out, and we're trying to solve for h over here. Now there's an m on both sides of the equation, so that is going to cancel. So the m's are going to cancel, and then. We've got h times g over here. So we just need to divide both sides of the equation by g. And then we get h is equal to 1 half v squared over g. So there's just a couple of steps to the algebra there. So when you work through the algebra, then you get option d. So very well done, everybody who gave that question to go a few steps to the algebra there. Now, the interesting thing with this that I'd like to point out is that the height doesn't depend on the mass because it divides out. So once we know how fast our rocket's going up, then that's everything we need to know to work out how high it's going to get. So it's a really important concept in physics. It really is the exact same situation as the roller coaster rolling down the hill. It's just we're solving for the uh, height instead of the velocity. Now, the last thing I'll say about this is please don't memorize this equation or any of the other equations. Uh, remember, so this gravitational potential energy, that comes from thinking about the amount of work we need to do to raise a mass to a certain height. And then this kinetic energy, remember, we got that by thinking about the amount of work that we need to do to accelerate some mass up to a velocity v. So even though it might look like there are some things there to memorize, please don't try and memorize any equations. We don't need flashcards or anything like this. The way to get familiar with this is just by working with them. You get that experience. You get really familiar with them. And then you don't need to memorize anything. So that's all I wanted to do for a, a recap of energy. So let's move on to some of the new concepts for today, thinking a bit more about thermal physics. Now, whenever we think about thermal physics, a crucial concept is power. Has anybody done a power before? OK, so some people, not too many. OK, so let's start by spending a few slides thinking about what we mean by power. So power in physics, it's defined as the rate of change of energy. So how much energy are we using in a given time? So based on that definition, which of these four equations could we use to calculate power? So remember, when we're talking about the rate of change of something, it's the same kind of idea as in kinematics. We're looking at how much something has changed divided by how long it took to do that change. So have a think about those equations. Which one of those is going to tell us uh, what we need to calculate power? OK, let's take a look at the responses. Let's see what we get for power. OK, looks like most people going for D there. Okay, So very well done, everybody who gave this question a go. Looks like most people got this right. OK, so uh, power, if you want to calculate it, is how much energy we use, that delta E, divided by how much time it took. OK, so option D, correct answer for power. So very well done, everyone who gave that a go. Now, you might be able to guess what's coming next when we think about a new concept. I'm sure you guys know how much I like units. So let's think what the units of power are. So just to give you guys a hint, it's a derived unit. It's not one of our base units. There's no base unit for how much energy we use per time. So have a think about this one. I get the question going. Let's see what everybody thinks for this. So just to remind you about the notation, remember those square braces, they mean the units of the thing in the square braces. 
Okay, very good. Good to see all those responses coming in. Let's see what everybody thinks. Okay, so looks like most people go in for option B there, okay? Now, this is a bit of a tricky one because you can't really figure it out from first principles if you don't know, but it looks like most people got the correct option there, option B. So very well done, everybody who gave that question a go. So whenever we think about how much power something uses, the units, they're always in watts. And what that means is how many joules of energy the thing uses in a given amount of time. So I've got a uh, light bulb over here. And if you look on the light bulb, so it actually says this is a seven watt light bulb. So what that means is in one second of time, the light bulb is gonna use seven joules of energy. So you might be used to the kind of traditional light bulb this big, it might be like a 60 watt light bulb that was very inefficient. Modern light bulbs much more inefficient. So this gives you the same kind of brightness just for seven watts, okay? So just to spell it out a bit, if we think about, you know, two seconds of time, that's gonna be 14 joules of energy. That's what we mean by, you know, a seven watt light bulb. Okay, so very good everybody who got that question great about the units for power. Now remember, so it's not a base unit. It's not one of our fundamental units, you know, like length or time. So let's have a think about what one watt is in terms of our SI base units here. Ah, there we go, there we go. Okay, so we have several different options for what a watt of power could be in terms of our SI base units. Remember that it's gonna be energy per time. So you might have to think about what the units for energy are in terms of our base units as well. So if you're not sure about this one, have a think about the units for energy, joules. So remember that's the units for work, which is force times the distance. So you can unpack everything you need for this question. We have covered everything. So work backwards, see what you're gonna get for energy used per time. Okay, let's see what everybody gets for this one. What's one watt of power in terms of our base units? Okay, so some people going for A, B and C. Looks like most people are going for D. So let's start from the top here. So the top is kilograms meters per second. So what's that gonna be the units of? Any thoughts there? So at the top, so it's a mass, so meters per second, that is a velocity. So option A, that's really mass times velocity. So that's the units of momentum. Now, if we look at the next one, so kilograms meters per second squared. So that's mass times meters per second squared, meters per second squared. Those are the units for acceleration. So. The second one there, that's the units of mass times acceleration, which are the units for force, okay? Then if we look to option C there, well, that's the same as the units for force, but multiplied by an extra meters there. So what we have is force times a distance. And remember, force through a distance, those are the units of work or energy, okay? So that's what a joule is. So then we're, we're nearly there, right? So with option C, those are actually the units for energy, the units for joules, and power is energy per time. So if we have a look at option C there, and then we say, what's that gonna be per second? Instead of seconds to the minus two, it's gonna be seconds to the minus three. So the correct option there is option D. So very well done, everybody who got option D. Now, if you're not too sure about this, that's absolutely fine. But remember, you don't need to guess with these questions. Some questions you just have to kind of take your best guess. But with this one, we've covered everything that you need to figure this question out. So, you know, if you're not sure what the units are, don't memorize them, but think, okay, well, it's gonna be energy per time. So think what the units for energy are. If you're not sure what the units of energy are, well, that's forced through a distance. So you can unpack it, you can work all the way back to, you know, just kilograms times um, acceleration really. That's the way to think about it. There's no need to memorize anything. So very well done everybody who got that question correct.
So what I'd like to think about now is a little bit about how this works in practice. So let's try a kind of numerical example. So what I've got over here, we're actually thinking about the power consumed by an average person. And this is one of the things that I find so interesting about physics, because you might think some of the questions we've been learning about are quite esoteric, or they're all to do with cars, or rockets, or roller coasters, all that kind of thing. But one of the reasons that energy is so important is because once we understand energy, it allows us to figure out such a range of things, okay? It's so broadly applicable. So we know that, you know, an average person, maybe they're eating about 2,000 food calories of energy per day. Now, one food calorie is actually a unit of energy, and it's equal to 4,184 joules. Now, we're going to find out a bit more about calories and why one calorie is that exact number of joules in a bit. But for now, we can just treat a calorie. It's just a unit of energy equal to some number of joules. So in one day, we know how much energy is going into our average person. So we can actually work out what the power is. So I think it's a really interesting example. So I'll get this question going. Let's see what everybody thinks for the power of an average person. So just to give you guys a hint, there's kind of a couple of steps to this. So step one, we need to work out how much energy we're eating in a given day based on those 2,000 calories. So remember, power, it's energy per time. We have to measure the time in seconds. So we're going to need to work out how many seconds there are in a 24-hour day. Once we have those two things, that's everything we need to work out the power of our average person. Okay, let's see what everybody gets for this one. What's our average power output here of a typical person? Okay, so most people going for C, nobody going for A. Okay, so very well done everybody who gave this question a go. And when you put in the numbers, when you work out how much energy you get, then you divide it by how many seconds in a day, what it comes out to, it's about 100 watts. Okay, so option C there. So very well done, everybody who gave that question a go. Wait, what does everybody reckon to that? Does that seem like a lot or not so much or surprising? Any thoughts about that? Oh, uh, yeah. Right, did everybody hear that? I think that's a really profound point, that with the physics that we've covered so far, we can calculate and write down exactly what the energy consumption of a human being is. So all those processes that make up life, with a bit of physics, we can work out what that power consumption is. Personally, I think it's extraordinary. You know, we often think of life as very esoteric. It's really complicated. We kind of leave it to the biologists to figure out. But just based on knowing how much energy is going in and how much time it takes, we can work out what the power is. Now, what about this 100 watts over here? What kind of things might we find that use about 100 watts of power? Any thoughts about that? So remember, so my, uh, where is it? Over here. My energy efficient light bulb has 7 watts of power. But if you have an old-fashioned, not-so-energy-efficient light bulb, that could give you 60 watts of power. So if you have a couple of them, that's going to be more power output than a human. So really, the, the human body is just absolutely extraordinary, right? Because all of that stuff that you're doing, all the thoughts you're having, all the activity you're doing, your body's doing that on less power consumption than two incandescent light bulbs. I really think it's absolutely extraordinary. Not only that the body can do it, but that we can calculate it. So very well done, everybody who gave that question a go. Okay, so remember, it's actually quite a useful ballpark to bear in mind when we're thinking about power. Typical human, they're going to be using about 100 watts of power. Now, what I'd like to think about next is where will this power go? So with a person, we're putting in, you know, 2,000 calories a day of energy. Where does all that power go if you're a person? Any thoughts? Oh, yeah. Absolutely right. <laughs> Brilliant. It goes into heat energy, okay? 
So you're going to be doing activities, you're going to be thinking things, you're going to be doing some things with that energy. But ultimately, all of that energy is going to end up as heat energy. So what I'd like to think about now in this question here is what exactly is heat on a fundamental level? So I've got a few different options here. You might want to ask the people around you. I'll give you guys a moment. Let's have a think about what exactly is heat at a fundamental level. I'll give you guys just a bit more time. I think if you're not sure, you know, take your best guess. We'll see what everybody thinks for this one. OK, let's see what everybody thinks for this one. What is temperature at a fundamental level? OK, so nobody's going for C. Some people going for A. Not so many people going for B. But most people going for D. Now, does anybody know what is interesting about option C, even though nobody went for it? Oh, yeah. Oh, no, everybody, absolutely right. So B is entropy. That's absolutely right. So, so B is what we call entropy. So a measure of the net disorder of something. Uh, now, that's something that we're going to cover maybe uh, a bit later, OK? Uh, so B, it is a real thing, but that's not what we mean by temperature. Uh, what about C, though? Does anybody know what's going on with C? So C was actually... Uh, one of the um, original hypotheses for what temperature is. The thinking was that temperature, it's what's called caloric fluid. And if something's very hot, it has a lot of this caloric fluid. And if something's colder, then that caloric fluid has flown out of it. Okay, So that was a kind of very old um, idea for what temperature might be. But it does kind of relate to this maybe intuition we have that temperature is something that kind of flows from hot and cold. So I am glad that nobody went for uh, C. Now, what about option A, the ratio of kind of positive to negative kinetic energy? Does sound kind of technical. Does anybody, can anybody spot why we could kind of eliminate that one, even if we weren't sure what temperature is? Any thoughts? Uh, yeah, Joe, you go OK, absolutely right. So it's really to do with this idea of negative kinetic energy. Now, when we're thinking about temperature, we often think about, you know, hot and cold. You know, you've got a hot tap that hot comes out of and you've got a cold tap that cold comes out of. And that can kind of lead us to think that temperature is all about a ratio of hot stuff to cold stuff. But if we look at the negative kinetic energy, well, remember, kinetic energy, it's half mv squared. Now, mass can never be negative. Mass is always positive. Now, velocity can be negative. We can have negative velocities, but we have v squared here. So even if our velocity was negative, v squared is always going to be positive. So half mv squared, it's always going to be positive. So we can never have negative kinetic energy. And this really kind of brings us on to what temperature really is all about. Uh, that molecules all have energy, some just have more than others. And what temperature really is, it's a measure of the amount of vibrations that the molecules have, the amount of molecular kinetic energy they have. So correct option is answer D there. Okay, so very well done, everybody who gave that question a go. Now, I just have one more question for today related to this. But before we get to it, I'd just like to show with you guys one more slide. And I think it kind of relates to why this situation is a bit confusing, why we often think about temperature in terms of, you know, this ratio of, of hot to cold. Uh, and I'd like to, by thinking a little bit about uh, speed limits, OK? So this does tie a little bit back to the first question that we saw today. So suppose we're thinking about speed limits and you're out driving and you see different uh, road speed limits. Okay, so maybe the slowest speed, you're going to have 20 miles an hour, maybe it's going to go all the way up to 70 on the motorway. And if we see a speed limit, we know what that is. That's how fast your car is going. Now, suppose someone said, well, cars, they usually drive maybe about kind of 40 miles an hour. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make my own speed scale for motorway speed limits. Okay, so instead of using this scale, 
what I'm gonna do, if you will indulge me for a moment, I'm gonna make my own new speed scale where instead of 40 miles an hour, on my new scale, I'm gonna call that zero miles an hour. I'm gonna call it zero of these, these new speeds because it's the kind of average speed that cars usually drive around at. So then on this new scale, instead of 50, it's gonna be 10, and, and then you, you know, so on and so forth, right? So instead of 60, it's 20, and instead of 70, it's 30, just because of that cars are normally driving around at about 40. And then if you're slower than that, so instead of 30 miles an hour, I'm gonna say that's minus 10 of this new slightly ridiculous speed. And then instead of 20, it's gonna be minus 20. I think that would be very confusing for all, for all kind of road users involved, okay? Because like minus 20, I don't mean you're reversing at 20 miles an hour, I mean you're 20 miles an hour slower than what I'm calling the average speed for cars, okay? So nobody would like that if they were kind of road speed limits. But this is actually kind of the situation that we have when it comes to measuring temperature. And this is really kind of the situation that we have when we think about the Celsius temperature scale, okay? This is really the, what Celsius would look like if it was a kind of motorway speed because a temperature of zero Celsius, we might think, okay, well, that's the freezing temperature of water. But even when water's frozen, those molecules, they're still vibrating, they're still shaking around, they still have energy. They don't have zero kinetic energy. So in Celsius, it kind of makes sense to talk about negative temperatures there. We mean they're colder than the freezing temperature of water. But even frozen water and things colder than that, the molecules are all vibrating around and they still have energy. So in physics, we don't use Celsius. We use what we call Kelvin, okay? And that's really closer to this situation at the top, okay? So let's just try one last quick question, thinking about the conversion between degrees Celsius and Kelvin. Let's try this last question here, just a quick question to finish up, okay? So the temperature scales are related. What we have is that zero degrees Celsius is equal to a temperature in Kelvin of 273.15 Kelvin. That's the relationship. So suppose we're a person, we have a temperature of 37.1 degrees Celsius. What's that temperature gonna be on the Kelvin scale? So just a quick question to wrap things up. I'll get that question going, see what everybody thinks for this. So if you're not sure about this one, take that zero degrees Celsius as the starting point, and then our person, they're 37.1 degrees Celsius warmer than that. So see what that's gonna give you in Kelvin. Okay, let's see what everybody gets for this one here. Okay, so looks like most people are going for C and D. So you just got to be a bit careful when you do the math, okay? Because remember, we're thinking about we're 37.1 units um, above zero, okay? So we've gone from zero Celsius to 37.1. So we need to add that 37.1 to the 273, that's gonna give us the 310 Kelvin, okay? So very well done, everybody who gave that question a go. Just remember, whenever we're thinking about physics things, it's actually quite important to be using the Kelvin scale, okay? It does make a bit more sense, even if we haven't seen the units before, okay? So I think that's a good place to wrap things up for today. Very well done with all the questions, everybody. On Thursday, we're gonna be thinking a bit more about the energy that we need to get these temperature differences, okay? So that's what we're gonna be doing next time. So, very well done, everybody, and I'll see you all on Thursday.